Um, I want to welcome Lauren DeJoya here with the streams and watching her evolve. I actually had the great fortune to be able to meet her face to face in Charlotte, and um, she just knocked my socks off. I, I met her on a police line as she was sitting there, and you know I was filming, doing some interviews of the people around. And I, I heard this young woman speaking so intelligently and articulately and so passionately, sitting right against the bicycles, just giving the police an earful. And I was like, oh, I, I totally have to have to see if this, this young woman will give me the time of day. And, of course, she was gracious and gave us a great interview right off the line. So that was, that was really inspiring to me. I, I can tell you my... My whole feeling about the movement was uplifted right there and then, which was, and you guys know how I love people who do stuff. So, you know, a big night for me, and welcome, Lauren. Hang in there, and it'll it'll all clear up at some point, and uh, we'll just forge on, and if we have a technical problem, you know the drill, we'll, re we'll reconnect. So, as the girl with the blue hair. Um, that became kind of my signature look, and that's how most people recognize me over the last year. Um, I first came into the occupation in Zuccotti Park as uh, part of the sanitation working group, and I basically tirelessly worked every day trying to keep the park clean and up to the, uh, up to the standards that I think could have kept the occupation going. Um, I, I'm 27 years old. I live in New Jersey. And I've been in the New York City area um, for the last year and a half or so, and uh, it's been it's been a wild ride. So I was involved in the park, and after the eviction, I joined the housing working group. I tirelessly tried to provide housing for a lot of the displaced occupiers that were in the city at the time, and beyond that, uh, also work in direct action, a lot of banner making, a lot of marches, uh, a lot of outspoken moments, and. Um, yeah, I'm just excited to to talk about the year and a little bit of reflection and what's coming next. Okay, um, great. So that's a good setup. So my first question is, um, can you share with us a little bit about your background? You know, where you came from, how you came to Occupy, why you came to Occupy, and tell us. Just happened to be walking by Zuccotti Park around the uh, end of September, and I saw a drum circle that was just kind of this very organic mix of people and everybody was drumming and it seemed a bizarre place to have a drum circle so I was intrigued and I stayed the whole day and I came every day after that and I, I um, about seven days later I started sleeping at the park and that was uh, I, the the feeling that I got the vibe that was there it was unlike anything I had ever seen before I had lived in New York City before and seen street musicians and all kinds of culture, and uh, but there was something different about this, and there was something about it being in the financial district at the foot of you know the World Trade Center site, and for me, um, I just couldn't I couldn't turn away. I, so I, I started getting involved and learning about the GAs and learning about um, what the call to Occupy Wall Street was about, and uh, at the time I was very ignorant to really this entire movement. I was about to, to to take off, and I, I was also unaware of what was going on in the Middle East. I was unaware of what had gone in Seattle and other uh, other uprisings that were happening around the world. So it was a huge wake up call for me um, to to be in the presence of something really really amazing and powerful happening in New York. So um, you know, my involvement at first was simply logistical. I I had this need to keep the place clean, and it comes from from these neat free tendencies I have, but I knew that the role I had was very important as far as keeping uh, the park as it was, you know, um, away from the Brookfield clenches, <laughs> a threat to shut us down. Um, so, you know, that was why I came was simply by accident and I stayed because I was really touched by all the people I met. I was really inspired by a lot of the stories that I heard. People were very open and honest and willing to share their testimonies of what they had been through and what was bringing them to the park and uh, for me it was just so beautiful and, and I was really touched by by people's willingness to to put themselves out there and to sleep you know on the granite in the middle of a park and uh, despite the police presence and people's um, initial reaction of, of awe and shock to the whole thing 
Um, and so I, I stayed because I, I learned how important it was and how um, and how much I, I needed to be involved because it, it meant a lot for my generation. It was time that the youth started waking up. And I, I was one of them that needed a, needed a serious reality check about what I was doing with my life and uh, where, where I was going and the fact that I was ignoring um, this huge unrest that was happening happening so I I stayed and I've given it I've given it everything I have and I sacrificed um the life that I thought I had to to discover that I actually was just finding myself and just getting to know myself and so you know that crazy two months in the park really really liberated a part of me that was that was laying dormant so it's been it's been incredible I I think you know it speaks super well of you that when you came to the park the way you chose to get engaged was by working with the sanitation crew because you know that's when you know you're committed right because you go in and you say there is you know it's grunt work and it's necessary but it serves a great purpose and for people to pitch in on that is um, absolutely you know an indication of character and that they're in it for the long haul because people that are just passing through probably um don't do that um so i wanted can you tell us you you said a little bit about you the life you thought you had that you were able to come to occupy and you reflect and consider the life you thought you had can you describe a little bit of that to us what was that life like was it suburban was it rural was it you know just kind of give us some context for the person that you are now. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah it, well, I've I've moved around quite a bit in the last five years. I mean, I, I was living in Florida, and um, I was in a cover band, and that was that was the most long-term life I had had, where I was a cover band singer on the weekends, and then I would wait tables. I've been a waitress for 11 years of my life, um, and it was mostly because I was a college dropout, and I wanted I had, I had always wanted to pursue music as a career, I hadn't always gotten the family support, though, and I got very discouraged. So um, waiting tables was a way that I could have some flexibility. And if I did get a music opportunity, I could easily cover my shit. I was living in Buffalo, and that's where he was from and his family was from. So we were going to start our lives together and what we thought was the American dream. We were looking at houses. We were looking, um, you know, at, uh, at where to settle in. In, and we had his family there for us and they were of course very um, supportive of us getting married and um, I was hoping to start a band there um, but there was something about the whole thing that just didn't feel right I, I always had a sense of restlessness I always had a sense of emptiness and there was something missing you know and I, I quickly discovered that Buffalo New York just not fast-paced enough for me I had always loved the city and living in Florida had been hard enough because the 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 pace down there is even slower. So, um, you know, I had to make a very hard choice and I was feeling, I was feeling deeply depressed, um, last year around, uh, I'd say July. And, um, my, my fiance at the time knew that there was something wrong, that I was just not feeling either living in that city or being with him or whatever it was. And I, one day he finally confronted me about it and said, I don't think you're happy. And I said, I, I'm not. I don't, I, you know, I'm in all this debt. I, I had collected a lot of credit card debt. I was paying this car payment I couldn't afford. I wasn't finding a, a band musical situation. And um, it was just becoming miserable. So I, I literally just decided to, to pick up everything I had and get in my car and drive to New York City. And I stayed with my dad in New Jersey. And I thought to myself, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't really know why I'm here. Um, I was driven to come back, and uh, I'm just going to figure it out. So I got a corporate restaurant job in Times Square, and I just started working a lot of hours. And, and I was able to live with my dad for free until I got on my feet. But that was not a fun situation. My dad and I butted heads a lot. Um, I mean, basic long story short, he's a Republican conservative Roman Catholic, uh, <laughs> devout Christian. He his views are very different than mine, and we always clash as far as you know um, him not agreeing with gay marriage and all sorts of things. So really, what prompted me to to come into the city the day I discovered Zuccotti was 
uh, a fight that the two of us got into. And I stormed out of the house, got on a bus, and started walking from Port Authority. And I walked all the way down to the World Trade Center. And to this day, I don't know what what um, what motivated me to go there specifically, whether it was to see the World Trade Center site, but, but something just drew me to that location. And then hearing the drums again was like this, it was this intoxication. a depressing existence and for someone my age you know I'm, I'm still young enough to really pursue the life that I think I should live and that will make me the most happy and that I'm the most passionate about and it really wasn't until uh, Occupy kind of lit a fire under me actually that I realized I, I hadn't really been living at all and I hadn't been being true who I was and, and what I was really capable of and the potential I had to do much more than just lead an ordinary life and have a husband and maybe kids and uh, that I could actually fight for people's rights and that I could actually inspire others and reach reach many many people with my voice which at the time I thought was only limited to singing so it's it's been you know it, it feels like a dream my life before really feels like a dream and, <laughs> compared and, to what it is now and like so many other people like you know you were you were awakened and now here here you are and that was a a beautiful yeah. story uh, one uh, let me check in with the chatters so um are we good on audio and video they've been having problems but it looks like it's cleared up on my end and before we get too deep into it i'm sorry to to, to break the continuity all good okay so we're going to go ahead if if it goes crooked you guys let me know and we'll reset um so it sounds like Occupy was your first entry into activism, that you came into it from a pretty benign uh, background and you hadn't been active and engaged and then you rolled into Occupy and now look look where you are. So um, do you feel like that was within you the whole time and it just didn't have the opportunity or the place to come out or, or what's the you know background on that? Yeah. How do you feel about that? It, uh, it totally was. I mean, um, ever since I was a little girl, I had had this um, infatuation with the 60s and the, the counterculture, the music, the, the anti-war movement. I, I was fascinated by this culture of people that just did not want to abide by the status quo and despite being dismissed um, by people who just thought they should get a job and cut their hair and take a shower. <laughs> that they they believed strongly against, you know, the injustices that were happening at their time and, you know, paired with also the women's movement and the civil rights movement. I, I'd always felt like I had been born in the wrong decade and I thought, oh, well, that was then and it's not going to happen now. And I grew up in a very apathetic generation and coming out of the 90s grunge movement, I was surrounded by a lot of youth that, you know, just said, oh, you know, everything's messed up and, yeah, the world sucks, but you know, just, just live your life and try to get by. And, it, and you know, so for me, I, I always struggled with that because I didn't feel that my generation was living up to what it should be and that there really should have been somebody carrying the torch. And there have been so many organizations since, since the 60s trying to, to carry that message and not let 
that spirit die and really trying to finish the work that's never been done. Um, but my only contribution really throughout my life was as a, as a passive um, activist at, at Beth. I donated to a lot of organizations when I had money. I, I um, used to do donate to a lot of cancer organizations and, um, you know, um, St. Jude's Hospital. Um, I, I was very, very into the rights um, movement, especially in the city. Um, unfortunately, when I was living with my stepdad, he'd throw away only having world news knowledge, having um, historical knowledge. I was very in the dark, and I chose to be. I said any young person who has access to, you know, the internet and has access to books and all kinds of resources. And, you know, I could have done more with college at the time. Um, that's, that's the power of apathy and complacency and um, just focusing so much on your own life. You, you don't realize how much bigger of a role you can have in, in trying to right some of the wrongs. So, you know, I, I sometimes I, I wrestle with, with the reality of wishing I had been more involved when I was younger and, especially when I see kids, you know, 15, 15, coming up and really stepping into their own as an activist, I think, my God, I wish I had known what you know then. So I'm kind of making up for lost time a little bit. I think that there's really not much of an excuse for somebody my age to not be more informed. So, you know, I'm, I'm here to really uh, to be an example for those who maybe haven't woken up yet and did what I did for you know, their 20s. Um, that you know, we we can always know more. We can always do more, and you you know you can't you can't just sit around and wait for others to do it. Right. Um, I think it's you kind of. I chuckled when you said making up for lost time because I'm twice your age and I say the same thing. <laughs> so it no. I, I'm I'm it's makes me optimistic that that's not a generational thing that everybody realizes oh you know there there is stuff to do and just to take a hold of it so i want to pause right here because we're still having a little bit of quality problems um i'm going to chatters i'm going to stop the stream and restart it shortly so just hang on it won't be a minute lauren if you'll stay on then we'll when we go offline we'll do the skype connection so i'll be right back okay. i want to archive this a little bit Okay, so um, you you came into Occupy, you were enlightened and awakened. Uh, I mean, it, it sounded like more more like a religious experience than I meant it to, but um, you it's, became yeah, an, a really engaged activist, and uh, I have had a chance to see that in action, and it's um, you're pretty incredible. So let's talk about your your year in Occupy, your evolution as a person, <clears throat> and um, what Occupy has has done for you. I mean, you've contributed a lot of time, energy, passion, and emotion to it, but you've received a lot from the movement itself, from the experience. So let's, let's talk about, you know, what Occupy has done for you as a person. Well, yeah, I, you know, I first I think about all the hours that I've put in um, to be a part of Occupy and to, you know, doing the work that I did, never getting paid a day. Um, and I I would so rather for my time in this than the hours that I worked trying to pay off credit card debt. So for me, I haven't felt like the hours I've put in really um, – it doesn't really even matter to me. What what matters, though, going forward is, is – you know, hoping that, that there are more people like me that, that are in a situation to do so that um, can come out and help. And because in the beginning, I I had a lot of growing up to do. And being around a lot of different people, it really it really makes you have to take a hard look at yourself, too. And for me, I, I struggled with temper. I struggled with um, not, um, not having control over some things that were out of my control and also experiencing things that as a white female I had never experienced before in my life such as being stopped and frisked or police brutality or being denied service at a restaurant or, or um, you know just being ridiculed being um, you know uh, dismissed by my family and friends 
losing family members to the movement. Uh, that's where it really started to hit me like, wow, you know, once once I commit to this, you know, there, there could be some repercussions. But um, when you start, when I started looking at the history of, of movements and what people had sacrificed, what, what we've been through in Occupy is nothing compared to what it could be or um, what what it has been in the past. And, uh, and it's been an amazing thing because I've, I've become so more so much more fearless. Uh, I never thought in my days before that I would be staring down uh, rows and rows of cops and really not being afraid, being able to laugh at them and laugh at the at the ridiculousness of the situation. So I'm really happy about that because, you know, uh, I went through my entire life being very afraid of the cops and never wanting to do anything wrong, at least not out in the open. And, you know, every time a cop would roll by, you know, you get that little, you know, that little tingle like, oh, I, you know, I hope they don't have a reason to pull me over or, you know, but now it's when you when you learn the system, you learn the the, the so-called justice system. Um, you know, you know what to expect. And for the rest of my life, I will always know my rights as a as a citizen, so long as they stand as <laughs> such. But also um, being able to talk to different people. It was my experience with so many different people, and having to grow up in in how to have a conversation, even with people that disagree with you so strongly. Um, that's one of the hardest things in this movement is uh, knowing you're right, but not being able to listen to others who also think they're right. And we we all have to be kind of willing to have a diplomatic conversation without getting into a screaming match, without getting into a fist fight. And I think a lot of people in Occupy have to still learn that. We have to learn how to be civil towards one another and respect each other's views and where we're at um, in our in our development and our evolution. And not everybody has woken up. And- not everybody has all the same information, um, and I have a hell of a lot to learn. I have so much more to learn and research, and that you can always know more. So for me, that's a constant evolution. That's constant learning and growing. Um, but over the over the year, I, I've had to redefine my role a few t- times. Um, I, I discovered what hitting burnout meant. Um, after my visit to Chicago, I, I witnessed a lot of a lot of beatings, and um, it was very it was very tiresome, and um, it, it it was disappointing. You know, it felt like these are cities that have had a history of uh, uh, unionizing and marches and protests, and you're seeing what's happening to that. That when anybody tries to display um, an act of civil disobedience or anybody wants to to have a rally. And, um, and draw attention to a cause, you see the reaction and you see the, the use of force. And, um, and I had to adjust how I dealt with that because at first I just wanted to get in the cops' faces and scream at them and, and you know, you think you're going to argue with them and sometimes at the end of the day you have to pick your battles and you have to, to choose your language more carefully. And I also got burned in the media. Um, you know, I made the mistake of doing an interview with a New York Post reporter, inviting her into a tent and... And um, she stayed the night with us, and we had a very candid interview. And um, the the article that she wrote was very defamatory towards me, and it was it was really hard. And that was the first time that um, I had seen my name published in print with things that I didn't agree were completely true. And so, also experiencing that end of it is this tabloid sensationalism that was created out of specific occupiers, where the the media latched on to certain um, so-called personalities and really exploited them. So I've had to learn how to be much more um, mindful of who I speak to and, and adapt with a security culture. And that was a term I had never known. Um, so it's been it's been such an amazing learning process. So much information to take in. Um, but it's been, it's been the presence of so many cool people around me that have either been there before or are going through it with you for the first time as well. And um, the, that sense of camaraderie, you know, the whole concept of solidarity was new to me. You know, I didn't feel solidarity with anybody, you know, not even my coworkers at work. You know, I didn't think they had my back at the end of the day. And now I march arm in arm, you know, in, in front of rows of police cops and, and I'm a, a police um, and I'm like, I know these guys got my back. And that's a, that's a great feeling. There's a comfort in that. And, um, you know, we just need more, more people to, to, to be willing to open you know, to all kinds of races, ages, di- any kind of diverse uh, backgrounds, you know, is, is that's what solidarity means. And it, and it means supporting your brothers and sisters, even if they don't always agree with you, even if 
even if their tactics aren't always the same as yours, and even if um, maybe their political views don't totally match up with yours. You know, at the end of the day, if you always represent yourself and you stand in solidarity with your brothers and sisters, you know, that's that's what builds our numbers. And and so, you know, I think that, you know, that's what I've learned over the year that has worked is, um, you know, always trying to keep that common thread and keeping the common and bond with each other and trying not to let the internal drama take us over the interpersonal relationships and pitfalls of that so you know it's it's been it's been a huge learning experience for me and i'm sure many others that have come to occupy and and also come to other other organizations over the years you know You've taken it upon yourself to become more uh, widely read and educated about movements and um, the history of social justice movements. Is is that accurate? Did I pick that up correctly? Yeah, I still have a lot of research to do. I mean, a lot of a lot of the research that I get is secondhand research, which uh -huh. um, sometimes is good, sometimes not as good. Um, but that's kind of part of the, the, the no one teach one principle, which I think has been the basis of Akai's um, spread of knowledge is that, you know, you have an individual who gets the research from a source and they teach it to more. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and that kind of just expands, expands. So you know, whether it's um, watching speeches or attending rallies or even marches, I mean, a lot of these events have been informational in themselves. Mm -hmm. I, I went for one example, I went to Foley Square for a rally. It was for a, um, a farmer who was being sued by Monsanto, and he was trying to counter sue. So the rally was there to support him in his efforts to defend himself. And there are all these people who came out with these placards with all of this information about Monsanto's history as a company, as a corporation from 1901 to present. And they just stood there with the signs in the rally. And I walked down the line and I, I read all of these these facts and lawsuits and and statistics about it and it, it, I was instantly educated um, much more so than I had just an hour ago so it's an example like that where um, as long as we're taking the time to provide the literature and somebody is taking the time to to do the research and and make it available and open source it um, you know and all people have to do is participate and you can learn something and that so, was going to be it, my next my my next question, do you find that are people open to that and do they participate and are there, is there an active effort widespread about uh, becoming more educated about issues that they don't, they don't know about? I, I think it's, it, it depends. It's kind of, it's mixed, you know. Um, some people are willing to, for instance, Google something or check out this, this link or, you know, um, Facebook has actually helped a little bit in that. A lot of people um, will post, you know, videos or articles, and you know, if people trust the person who's posting it, they might be more interested in reading the article versus, you know, uh, a professor telling you, okay, you have to do this. And and there is a difference between, you know, having to pay for education, and you're there to learn because you paid to be there, and then you're you're looking to learn because you actually just do want to learn. Right. And there are people willing. To teach you for free so sometimes people are receptive to to doing the research um i mean for me i i was in a position where i was getting so much media attention that i felt it would be really dumb of me to not be informed and to to be in front of these cameras and not be able to form a sentence and that but i think that was a little bit of my maturity at the time and not wanting to look stupid on camera um that was really my motivation at first and then i realized once you know something else then it, it sparks your interest in something else and then it's just this cycle where you just never want to put away the wikipedia files and you know so it's um i think it just depends i think if you can approach people in a way that you know you, you start with something Something they're actually interested in and then you can somehow tie other things together I think that is one way that you can actually slip in information to people where they may not even realize they may be learning about a subject they would think is boring right but you frame it in a way that makes it more interesting and there's there's other ways to give people information that aren't so um, you know a typical you know school book education style where you can do even in the form of uh, shows and concerts and plays or um, yeah, I've seen so many different theatrical ways of giving people knowledge, whether it was like Occupy Broadway or what Occupy the Spectrum.
Orchestra Pipeline is doing, um, where they're, they're taking their theatrical backgrounds and giving people information in a way that keeps them engaged and keeps them listening. Um, people's attention spans today are very small and we get distracted easily. So I think that there's different ways to get around it. But yeah, the receptiveness, it, it depends on where you are and who you're talking to. And, you know, I, th I think it varies. Yep. Uh, it, that was kind of a personal question, but it's something we talk about a lot because you're part of our, I mean, our our goal with OPN is to education and information sharing. And so I'm really interested in that because I believe there's a really great value to be had by reflecting upon history, learning the lessons, adapting. And I can say personally that working with Occupy for the past year has been the single greatest social and political education I have ever had because just doing these interviews I'm reading constantly and now I can't even have a normal conversation with people at lunch because I'm like did you read about the NDAA blah 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 you know and it's you know because I just am voracious about consuming that stuff and for much the same reason because when I talk to people like you or any of the other guests I want to be able to at least form an intelligent question um, so it's been mm -hmm. a great educational experience, and I really believe that's extremely valuable for all of us. Um, what do you think, in, in your opinion and your observations, what do you think the successes of Occupy have been, and what challenges has it run up against as a movement? I love this question. Um, <laughs> Well, the, it's been, I feel like it's been um, played like a broken record over this year. The, the success of Occupy was definitely changing the conversation. Everybody always says that. Um, and unfortunately, like anything that becomes trendy, um, certain language that becomes popular, it, it becomes embedded into everyday um, you know, life. Um, definitely the concept of the 99% versus the 1%. Uh, the conversation involving solidarity, uh, a drawing drawing more of a connection to the economic inequality and, and that everything leads back to Wall Street. I, I don't think that was as much mm -hmm. on the tip of people's tongue before Occupy. Um, there have been movements mm -hmm. past that have drawn attention to Wall Street. I mean, ACT UP had die-in in 1989 in front of Wall Street. So there's definitely been people who have been trying to get people's eyes to look towards the stock exchange and look on Wall Street and see the gambling casino for what it is. Um, but it wasn't until Occupy did it in a very, um, very fun and engaging kind of almost comedic way at times where, you know, you had this, uh, this idea of this ballerina on, on a bull, um, you know, the the T-shirts the and, and, and it became, it almost became a commodity. And sometimes that is the only way people can digest what you're talking about mm -hmm. is if you turn it into a product if you turn it into something that they can hold in their hands and they can say oh okay i get it they are sleeping in a tent in a park because they don't like wall street and wall street greed and then the corporations have something to do with this so people start to they start to open it up and we didn't let up it was this relentless you know we are going to be here all day all week and people are like wow they're really they're really gung-ho about this so you start you know, you, you start to see an interest in the fact that there were people willing to stage themselves in a park and in form of protest. They were doing, we were doing it peacefully, which was always working in our advantage and in our favor. And I think that that needs to continue is the, the nonviolent aspect. I think that's what drew people's attention and interest is the fact that we weren't resorting to uh, blowing up the bank. We were resorting to picketing in front of the bank or sleeping in front of the bank um, and, and I think that people will always respect it for that. Now, obviously one of the challenges is that we respect a diversity of tactics and there have of course been incidents of, you know, bottles being thrown on in bricks windows. And these are, these are small incidents throughout the country that were blown up and all tied into a narrative that portrayed an entire movement as, um, a bunch of anarchist extreme uh, violent people that needed to be stopped and mm. that's probably the most frustrating thing that we face is the the media backlash the media either dismissal at times or flat out um, misrepresentation at times or they managed to get that one real story and just blow it in into this embellished sensationalist um, you know drama 
and, and people sink their teeth into that. So it's, it's been frustrating because when you, when you decide to have an all-inclusive movement, you're going to get the good and the bad and the ugly. And I think one of our biggest mistakes was we weren't able to recognize from the beginning what the potential was for this to get taken advantage of and what the potential was for having all of these donations flow into a park that was including everyone off the street, you know, we didn't just determine whether or not we were going to actually take care of everybody that showed up or if we were going to just try to keep on going and keep them off to the side as much as we could to keep our message on point. And I think that, you know, there should have been some way of dealing or at least addressing um, that issue of having people completely misrepresent the, the movement or use the movement, abuse the movement, you know, sit under the Occupy banner and really not contribute much either intellectually or physically. Um, became, it became very draining, you know. So on one hand, we were trying to inspire the nation to get behind us and rally around this cause and come out in the streets and support. But all the media ever was able to get footage of was people sit on the side spanging, you know, begging for change, taking that money, buying cigarettes or booze. And, and for a lot of us that were not there for that, that were not there for a handout, that we're, we're trying to do good work and only wanted enough for us to be able to survive in the situation we were in, we felt taken advantage of. And, and it was never re resolved. It's still not resolved. And um, that continues to be one of the challenges because it was a turnoff for a lot of people, the disorganization. Um, their challenge, I think, was uh, the, the police presence. I think that once there was the coordinated attempt and successful um, elimination of all the encampments around the country, uh, we really had a setback. We no longer had our, our place um, to peaceably assemble in, in, a, in a way that was a real hub. I mean, you had everything in these encampments. You had the info, you had the, the food table, you had the medic table, you had, you know, the think tank, the, the GA spot. You, you had this access, and it's very easy for people to access it. When you could display your message, display your art, have, have your meetings, and that was all taken away from us. And, um, you know, we, a lot of cities around the country had a hard time recovering from that. And the numbers started to go down. And we also alienated a lot of people who wanted to help just because they maybe had a, um, a higher status in society or they were affiliated with a political party. Um, I never thought that we should be endorsed by any political party, but there were individuals specifically who were looking to help. And um, it, because we were so afraid to be co-opted, um, we, we turned away a lot of people who might have been there to do some real good and to, to have our support. And that, that will trickle into a word of mouth um, scenario where, you know, Occupy starts getting dismissed by potential supporters. So I think we have to reevaluate what we're really doing. And, you know, if being an all-inclusive movement right now works, yes, we are all the 99%, we'll always be the 99%. But our battle is not so much with the 1% right now. It's really with us. It's really with each other and, and lifting each other up and, and being able to look each other in the eye and say, hey, are you doing as best as you can? Are you representing this movement as well as you can? Are you being the positive role model that we want our kids to, to look up to? So, you know, we, we've, had to, we've had to overcome that a little bit, you know. And, um, you know, hopefully going forward uh, we can – we could start focusing on, on specific issues and really start targeting certain things that will get the support back, you know, mm -hmm. like bringing, bringing criminals on Wall Street justice or, you know, doing debt resistors um, campaign. So it, I think that that'll be one of the ways that we can kind of um, bring a little bit of support back by going to more specifics right. instead of trying to do everything all at once. That was a really eloquent overview and, and it, it, I think it puts everything in a really good perspective, and I appreciate your comments on that. I want to go down just a little tangent, and, and then I, I want to start moving forward a little bit. Um, so you've mentioned media numerous times, um, mainstream media, print media. Um, how do you feel that, that we, the independent media, as a whole, you know, all the streamers, all the bloggers, the people that you see in the streets every day, um, have do you feel like we have represented the movement well and served it well, 
or is there some improvements that we could do too? And I want you to be honest. I'm not looking for gold stars. I just I want to get a good contextual overview. We know about MSM, so let's talk about indie media and how our roles that we're playing and how well are we doing that from your perspective. You know, that's a hard question to answer because I I've known a lot of streamers personally and I've gotten to know how it's different for every streamer and I think every individual streamer goes through their own trials and tribulations of trying to cover what's going on. So I think overall you you guys have been vital in this movement. You guys provide eyes where the, the mainstream media sometimes doesn't care to show up. And the, the documentation, especially during an arrest, is so important. So I think that, you know, having that independent coverage, having that other lens, you know, is, is, it's been so, so great to have. And I have really felt so bad for you guys at times. I mean, you guys have been targeted over the last few months I've watched, especially near the beginning of a few months in, um, live streamers specifically were targeted and, and had their equipment broken, had their equipment stolen. Um, that's not easy to recover from. I have a friend right now, he's trying to get a hotspot. You know, he can't do what he can do without his hotspot. And there is a little bit of competitiveness coming out of the streams, um, whether it was Global Revolution and being competition with Occupied Air, or you know, then there's Occupy Eye, then there's Jenna Pope's signal. There's all these different signals coming in, and you're all hoping to get the viewership so you can keep going. Um, you know, I think that the only critic criticism I would have is um, being careful not to uh, go off on tangents with the live stream. Like, and this happens more, I think, in New York City as I watch a few of my friends who will forget that they're streaming and forget how important that is and that it's a it's a responsibility and sometimes get caught up in um, conversation with people that that really it's it's not doing anything for the viewer they're not providing anything um, you know informational uh, or or you know anything that that's gonna let them know like what's going on that week or events are coming up what marches are coming up um, so that's the only thing is like always making sure when that camera goes on, like it's because there's either something happening or that it's informative or, uh, you know, and th this is more like, I, I wish I tell these people in person just, you know, cause I've seen, I don't watch the live stream that often cause I'm usually out doing something, but a couple of times I've seen some people where it's kind of like, why, did, why is the stream on right now? I don't really know what's going on. And it makes the viewer confused. And, um, I think that would be my only criticism is that, you know, uh, it's almost better to stream a little bit less because then you, you build an anticipation for when you're going to go on next. And mm -hmm. that's been something I've heard from some of the successful streamers is um, not streaming everything and really picking good, good events and, and knowing, okay, this is, this is something that people are going to want to watch because that viewership is important. Also that it's, it's also something important for the movement. So that would be my only little thing right. I'd say. So now I that, want to make sure it's relevant. <laughs> yeah, that was that was helpful because when we were in Charlotte, uh, Organizer X and I were working with a bunch of people and we were having this discussion like, um, what are our strong points? What are our weak points? How can we do it better? How can we serve better? Because in in a lot of us have that feeling that we're here to serve the people in the streets, the viewers are chatting, like we're trying to build those bridges, you know, so I'm always interested in getting feedback on how we're going to do. Um, the The final specific Occupy question, then we're going to move on to other things, is um, do you think that Occupy serves as an agent for social change and how has it done, uh, how successful has it been in that capacity, if so? I, I think that Occupy is just another, it's it's kind of just another little push among a lot of groups. I think that um, Occupy has just joined the ranks, really, of, of people fighting against these injustices. Um, I don't believe for a second that Occupy Wall Street is the all and end all of activism in this country nor this world. I think the fact that we were able to inspire so many people around the world is incredible and um, we need to continue to try to um, have some more momentum, but I think it's just it's just one aspect of the fight, and I think that it takes all of us. You know, all these organizations, what Code Pink is doing, what ACT UP is doing, um, you know, what Earth First is doing. 
there, there are so many, and there's also so many splinter organizations that are coming out of Occupy, which is really cool right now. I mean, you're seeing like, for instance, this, um, this book, which just came out, if you guys could see that, the Debt Resisters Operations Hand or Manual. It's basically a handbook for how to resist debt. And um, this, is a, this is a beautiful thing, Re, you know, resulting in Occupy Wall Street. Also, the, the title um, uh, publications, which is Occupy Theory, very well written, very eloquent. Um, these, these guys know their stuff. And so we're, we're just joining the ranks. We're, we're, I think if we continue to work with other organizations and not limit ourselves to just what we can do, um, that's, I think, how we're going to continue to have relevance in, in today's world going forward because people get bored easily. People, people do think we're a trend, and I don't believe we're a trend. I still believe everything I believed when I first realized that this is what I believed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, there is still so much work to be done. Uh, we aren't seeing the justice that we want to see anytime soon. We are in a crisis, and that is that is the reality of it. Um, and I think I think that Occupy has a part in it. I think that um, it's just going to take you know more more creative thought on our parts, and and really figuring out how we how we pitch it to people in a way because people need to be sold on this. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. unfortunately, it's not enough to say, "Can't you see the world crumbling around you?" Can't can't you see the banks are swindling our, our money? Can't you see that it all ties to Wall Street? You know, it's, for a lot of people, when they're when they're very distracted with their own personal lives, it's not it's not easy to see. So we just gotta, you know, you just have to keep going. You know, um, a lot of movements take years to get off the ground, and we had a very a very quick head start. Right. So uh, we can't get too ahead of ourselves, and you know, I think that it's just pairing up with more and more people, more and more types of groups. That are that are out there trying to get the attention towards these these issues that are all universal um, right now. That's that's how we're going to continue to to grow. Excellent. So, um, how do you feel about the intersection of art and activism? Well, I've I've always believed that art is is uh, is vital. I mean, uh, um, art and music in general, from elementary school age. I mean, even even before that, kindergarten age. Uh, music and art is is vital, and it's it's how we learn to be creative. It's how we learn to imagine, and um, this movement I don't think would have been anything successful if it was not for the art and the imagery and the creativity of the people involved. Um, I myself have felt more inspired because of the imagery and ooh, we got sirens in the neighborhood. I don't know if you guys can hear that. At yeah, all, we can. Just, yeah. The black helicopters are coming. <laughs> <laughs> they're coming for me <laughs> but uh but no like i there, there's so many beautiful images that come to mind i mean even the ad busters ad, ad had uh you know the the ballerina on top of the bull that that that's advertising but it's art you know and it's rare that advertising is art because often it's it's actually just subliminal garbage um so i think that that's been really important what the screen printers guild has done um as you know given people a piece to take home, and and even though it's it's a commodity and they're selling it for a donation, um, the 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 expression that these issues allowed us to have, all the different creative ways people are expressing their frustration with the system and with the government, um, it has led led to some beautiful beautiful artwork. Artwork from May Day was incredible. The image of the the girl lighting the match um, was a was a really pretty picture. So I. I think is is vital, and I think that artists are always the first to be the revolutionaries. I think artists tend to be the first ones to really get involved in activism because they understand the preservation of what makes art possible, and that's having the freedom of expression, being able to speak the way you want, being able to set up your installations the way you want. You know, art is freedom, and if and if our freedoms are being you know assaulted, there's a possibility possible assault on art, because especially political art, art that, that says a, a message that maybe the government doesn't agree with, they can get you some trouble in some countries. You can't be as free as you want to with your art pieces. So um, I, I think that that's why arts, artists and musicians are always kind of drawn to activism, because they feel it's part of their duty in, in order to express um, what they feel. You know, they, they're going to rise up to the occasion. Yep. Yep, and and I I actually am a big proponent of arts and activism, and I love to see it all the all the color, all the signs, 
everything and you know you said it best art is freedom and you know it's freedom of expression and it can be a incredibly valuable tool in the movement so um, as an artist and you know you have a background as an artist um, I know you have this new project coming on and so I want you to tell us about your new project because I, I have to say having been involved with a lot of it is like my favorite Occupy project to date. I think it, it is the one that I would have done if I could do it myself. I'm like so so enthusiastic about it. So let's let's tell everybody about your project in great detail as much as you would like to. <laughs> well, it, I love that that's what you said that you said uh, if I could have done it, this is what you would have done because I, I feel that what, what people need to understand about the people over profit tour is that this is not something everybody can do. Uh, my my fiance Jack Aminko and I are in a really unique situation where we do not have a residence, we do not have assets, we are young and energetic, and we want to we want to go out on the road. We want to live on the road, traveling, spreading the message, going from town to town, city to city, wherever our itinerary leads us and really continuing the work that we've done. Um, all of this kind of came about a few months ago um, when Jack and I were living up at this community farm. Um, it was kind of like a commune, intentional community type setting, but it was all very um, basic, just getting off the ground. And um, we were living on 186 acres and there was a bus available up there at the time. And it was when we first had this, this kind of light bulb go off and we were like, what wouldn't it be amazing to have a bus and to be able to tour and do work with other organizations and to do out outreach in places that maybe don't get the message ever and places that have been cut off from, from the culture that goes on in New York City, from activism that is so prevalent here? Um, wouldn't it be amazing to see what we can do? And, um, you know, at the time, things didn't work out that great, and uh, the bus fell through. We needed a lot of funds at the time, and it, it needed a lot of work. But when we got back to um, New York after our tour in Tampa and in Charlotte for the RNC and DC, uh, the, this link for a bus came up, and it was sent to us from our friend who's from Maine, and it was a, of this incredible uh, transit bus that is from 1963, and um, it was taken out of service and completely renovated over the years. It's now um, fueled on vegetable oil. It has solar panels on, on the roof. Part of the roof also converts into a stage. The, the inside has 12 bunks, um, so to sleep 12 comfortably. Uh, it's gray water um, system all connected. It has a kitchen built in. Uh, this thing is a, is a mobile home. It's, it's literally a mobile home. And all we kept thinking of is all the amazing things we could do with this bus and what this bus could enable us to do not only for other people but maybe inspire many more buses on the road and there are a lot of caravans that travel there's a lot of organizations like caravan for peace and there's uh, um, some of the rainbow gatherings have buses and, and um, there is occupy the roads um, which is uh, this one woman she has a smaller uh, vehicle that she uses and we just we wanted to kind of join that whole whole experience of, of being able to travel and people knowing that we're coming and being able to to do things from the bus and have a have a command center really to operate out of to to do art out of to you know record music or hold interviews in you know uh, we're planning on bringing a live streamer with us and he would have a, a base to edit his film out of and we can do stories and it's really for us we know that that the the Possibilities are endless. I mean, there's really, there's so many different routes that you could take with something like this. But you need the vehicle, and you need a home. You know, and for a lot of us, especially after the eviction, a lot of us who had chose to live in Zuccotti Park, um, we didn't have anywhere to go after that. And it's not because we couldn't have just, you know, gotten a minimum wage job and tried to find a, a tin can to live out of. But it, it was, it was because we knew that we wanted to stay mobile and we wanted to be able to travel and we just enjoy so much meeting people and for me it, it's been that's been part of the experience this whole year and that's I think what helped me 
uh, evolve as much as I did is the, the interaction with people. So, you know, we came up with this idea of, you know, what, what does it really boil down to? You know, you can, you can talk about Wall Street, you can talk about Occupy, but at the end of the day, what, what is the, the main problem in this country? And it's, it's the profit being chosen by people and it's all these daily choices where satisfying somebody's bottom line is sacrificing the well-being of someone else and that's why we called it people over profits we, we kind of want to get that that message across to more to more individuals of that you know you do matter more than you know the paycheck of your boss and you do matter more than and the pucks that are being made to actually poison you and you matter more than all these. I mean, you can go on and on and it's, you know, so, so the, the goal here is if we can get the bus, we begin this campaign. We begin this campaign of educating people in a similar way that we were educated, where you're taking a collection of literature. I mean, it's everything from the title magazine to Naomi Wolf's work, Cornel West's work, Chris Hedges' work. You know, we're looking at um, a curriculum that focuses on some of the more radical uh, work that is out there that's really drawing attention to not only the crisis we're in, but also we're not looking for people that are going to sugarcoat it. We understand that we can't always explain the dialogue in the same way you and I can talk about it. Uh, because I think we're just a little bit more open and um, understanding, but I think that you have to at least provide it and say that when you're ready, this is here, and we'd love to sit down and have, you know, a uh, a, a step one intro into understanding, you know, your government, or a step one intro into understanding um, the rights and maybe how your civil liberties are being violated, and that, you know, these are the things that have happened. So we're we're trying to set up a way that we can um, we can really reach out to people that I think will help them understand more why they're in the situation they're in and understand that they're not a failure because they're in debt, that they're not a failure because they can't occupy, or that they're they're not it's not that they're necessarily doing anything wrong to perpetuate the system, but that there are specific changes in their lifestyle that they can make that will will start making a positive impact and will start making a, a, a good difference. In, in maybe the lives they live. And the bus model for the life we'd like to see people live. We'd love to see people get off of, of gasoline. We'd love to see people switch to solar power and, and the gray water system. And, you know, if we go out there and we are displaying that everywhere we go, I think that that kind of just continues to physically tie into our narrative. And, um, you know, we've been, we've been reaching out to, to people like Naomi Wolf, you know, I um, am hoping that she gets my email, you know, and really just asking advice because we want we want to do this the right way. And part of what we realize is that more than anything, we want to show people that the stigma that has been attached to Occupy, that we are, you know, just a bunch of angry kids and that we're violent and that we don't know what we want and that we um, that some of us are trust fund babies and all this stuff that people say. We, we want to be representatives, not that we're leaders of this legalist movement, but simply that we're, we're here and we can testify that, that this changed our life and this is why. And all we want is an opportunity for you to feel what we felt when we realized it. And yes, it's tough to know the, the issues. Yes, it's tough to know the reality of the, of the dire situation we seem to be in, but that there, there is light at the end of the tunnel. We don't want this to be a campaign just to spread how bad it is. We, we want this to be a campaign of hope and that there are ways um, in our local communities that we can be more active, that we can be more engaging with each other. I think that there needs to be more of an establishment of community, not just that we all show up at a community, totally recreate that for people again. But I think if we can provide some of the energy and the atmosphere in the, in the literature and the art and music and the just simply uh, being there to, to volunteer our time and show how willing we are to to help I think that it, it can have an impact on people and I've already seen it you know when we were in Chicago um, people that met us that had known us from Occupy were, were excited to get to know us and then you know working alongside us all, all uh, weekend um, you know people were very inspired I mean I was helping out in the kitchen 
you know, helping to make meals. It's, it's something as simple as that. It's those gestures where instead of just, you know, sitting around, you, you, you're, you're a surf and you take the initiative to, to, to do work wherever you feel you can apply your energy. And we're lucky that we're, we've still got some energy to give. This year hasn't knocked us out yet. <laughs> and we recovered from our Chicago burnout. So, you know, if it, if it doesn't happen on the Indiegogo campaign, uh, we, we know that we're going to raise some money because this, this is basically our dream and and after a year of, of working the way we have we are ready to take it to the next step and you know we're in a position to do so so you know that that's really what it's about and we're hoping that people can if they can't donate a, a monetary donation to help purchase the bus at least they can spread the word they can encourage other people to to learn about everything that we're talking about and and to to do research because at the end of the day that's all we really want people to, to take away from it is that we can always, always be more informed mm -hmm. and you, you may just learn something and it may inspire you to act um, so that's that's really the goal with this is is uh, to, to get allow us a vehicle to transport, you know, giant and our crew to city to city, and do whatever work needs to be done, and that that, that will all kind of come along the way as we work out all of the logistical um, concerns, like licensing and learning to drive a four-way foot bus. It's going to be very interesting. Yeah. So, you know, that's where we're at. It's a it's a fantastic project, and um, I I love it because um, two things. One you know, you're speaking to it constantly about it's it's an educational platform to draw people in, to educate them and inform them. And I love that you said uh, about, you know, to, to go in and spend time with people, just not do an overnight or something like that, that you're going to go and engage people. The other thing is that it, it, is, it is teaching by example. I mean, it's hard to argue with the bus and it's it's vegetable oil powered and it's got solar and it's like you're living I mean you're living it by example and people find that very inspiring and um, I do too and just the educational content and what you could bring uh, like in in our area very rural very conservative um, there's a desperate need for stuff like that and some of us are trying to do that locally but to have something on the road with your you and Jack's, and I know Michael's the streamer, you know, the people involved with the backgrounds and experience that you have, it, it would just be a gift to any community that you, you came to. So so I'm really hoping this goes, and I really want you to hold on to that, that dream. And if it doesn't happen with Indiegogo, make it happen some, some other way, because there's a lot of us out here wanting to help you do that so what is your what would be your ideal timetable right now get it well, as soon I mean, as you can you know, learn how to drive it and get on the road right <laughs> yeah you know the the way the schedule is looking is that i mean obviously ideally the the campaign ends october 31st so that is when the indiegogo uh account will be closed and you will no longer be able to donate um, and then the money takes uh, a little bit of time to actually come to us. Um, and uh, the way the account works is that we don't receive any funds until the campaign is done. Mm -hmm. So we won't really know what we're working with at the very end. And um, the, the owner of the bus right now has said that if the campaign starts to do well, he will um, take the bus off the market. It's been on the market for about six months, almost seven um, so there haven't really been too many other takers. Apparently there was one other Occupy group that inquired about the bus but never actually went through with um, any sort of negotiation. So he he's definitely interested in, um, in reserving it for us if we can show that we are in fact raising the money mm -hmm. and he can know in confidence that he is at least going to have a down payment. That, you know, end of October, the campaign ends. And I mean, I... I had wanted to have this bus um, on the road by the end of the year, but with CDL licenses, we don't quite know how long we're going to be looking at for uh, for that, and that, that's why we were asking a little bit over the goal. The bus itself is selling for 22500 mm -hmm. and we do need to take into consideration that licensing may cost um, some money. Um, we may be able to read register the bus for a discounted rate through the Green Bus Collective, which would be great, which are some friends of ours. Um, but there are also some um, 
settings like food, we did want to be able to stock up on food for the bus because one of the things we wanted to do in every city was um, have, you know, the people's kitchen and have that food available and really um, let that be our first statement when we come is that, you know, we, we always provide a free meal. And that's something that I, I've all, always loved about the people's kitchen, that that food is there and they never expect a donation. They, they always appreciate it. But so that's one thing I definitely wanted to have. So it's all going to come down to how long it takes for us to get the bus um, you know, get from Maine, the licensing, get the registration, get it stocked, and then get it on the road, um, and then stocking up on fuel, of course. With veggie fuels, is really cheap, so that's that's a plus. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just a lot of things have to fall, fall into place. It all depends on the funds we're working with. So, you know, I'm I'm really hoping it's this bus simply because if it's not, if we if we aren't able to get that bus, or if he ends up selling it to somebody else. Um, it may be more difficult to find something that has everything that we're looking for off the bat that doesn't require the conversion from, you know, diesel to biodiesel. It doesn't require the solar paneling, which can be um, a little bit expensive if you can't get them salvaged. So, uh, you know, there, there's quite a few things to take on, and, and it's, it's, a big, it's a big ambitious deal, you know. It's, it is not easy, and I think that when people look at the campaign, um, they don't realize how much work is going to go into this and how and how difficult it is to get something like this off the ground it's it's definitely not easy but we we are so confident that it is what we want to do that we're meant to do is we haven't been able to get this off our minds for the last few months and i i'm always a believer that if, if something just won't get off your mind uh, it's probably because it's what you're supposed to be doing and it's right. that nagging feeling you know so that's um you know, we're, we're going to keep trying no matter what. But yeah, any kind of support that people can give us, whether it's, you know, just spreading it to people they know, talking about it with coworkers around the water cooler, whatever it is, you know, it's the conversation is all that really matters at the end of the day. It's, you know, that's that's what was so important, you know, on day one last year, you know, was was engaging in that conversation. So I'm hoping that comes across. To yep. So, well, we're going to work very hard, and all. I mean, I think people are already tweeting the links and doing all that stuff. So, I, honestly, you hit the nail on the head. It's it's like I know people that I show this to, and they go, "Yeah, I want some of that. That's a great great idea." People who have no idea what Occupy is or anything, but I I go at it from the you know my thing is story collecting, story sharing to educate and inform so I say you know here's that and they say oh that's that's right down your alley yeah I'll chip in a little bit for that so that's what we got to do we just got to get it out there in circulation and do that um, so yeah my next question was how do we see your your future unfolding I think you just pretty much described all that for us <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's mean, about you know, the bus you, yeah <laughs> yeah and you know just I mean it's exciting it's exciting for us too you know this is this is a gift that it, it will it, it really just literally keeps on giving I mean you have you have us being able to be really fueled to, to do this on the road and then the learning experience that we are going to have it's you know it's, it's nothing that we have gotten in a university you can't buy this kind of education you, you can't buy this kind of experience these are these are priceless moments you know and I, I wish more people were in a, in a position to do this, you know, I, I, I'd love to see young people who maybe they get out of college or if they decide to go to college, wh whichever they, they prefer and, you know, get some money together and get a bus and go out on the road and see the country. There are so many places I've never seen, you know, I, I've never been to the Grand Canyon. I have never been to, you know, the, most of these states parks, these national forests. Uh, I've never seen the Midwest. I mean, this is going to be an crazy experience for me as well, as somebody who has not really been ex exposed to the geography of the U.S. So it's it's going to be an exciting adventure um, for both of us. Um, you know, Jack lived in Alaska, which is a part of the country that I've never seen. And, uh, you know, it's, um, 
it's that kind of adventure where you know somebody tells you how beautiful a place is and it's like you have to see it you have to see you have to go there so that's part of it is that you know it's not just what we can do when we're in these communities but but also the experience of being there ourselves you know so right. all that working together i'm super excited i know it's going to happen somehow and i just have to stay positive because it's such a daunting feeling sometimes you know you you know that there's so many organizations out there that need support and so many causes but we really want to do something good and yep. you know well i think it, we're glad to have these outlets <laughs> yeah i think the, the feeling i get and one of the reasons i'm so comfortable you know supporting it is because you're coming at it from a spirit of generosity in that you want this this tool so you can go out and do this work so you can give of your experience and your knowledge so you can help other people so it's you know it it's a big project yes and of course it's going to be a great education for you but you're clearly willing to invest so much more back into it to help these communities and help these people and help spread the word and help educate and that that is priceless so you know that's one of the things that i find so compelling about you and jack both it's just the way you are approaching things you know you like i learned this and i want to share it and it speaks really well of you um what advice or call to action would you like to give the viewers and chatters Oh, I don't know. No, I mean, I think, I think the viewers and chatters are great. Um, you know, I know that, that sometimes people are limited in what they can do. And I think that it's just, whether it's writing a blog or, you know, um, you know, tweeting something out that they read, I, I think it's just taking, taking time every day. You know, if you can't physically be there, you know, if you can't physically go um, either to an action or to a meeting or whatever it is, I think that there, there are, ways that we can always um, keep up on world news and and kind of spread that out little things that we find that we don't think everybody might be reading um, also like alternative news um, don't don't be limited by what the US media is putting out I'm sure a lot of you know that uh, but always make sure you're searching um, international news as well because there's a lot of stories that never hit the US border and it's really powerful stuff. And sometimes they are reporting better on our country than we are. And of course, this shouldn't surprise most people. Um, so definitely, there's outlets like uh, BBC, Al Jazeera, um, Russian Times. There's, there's quite a few. But um, yeah, definitely like the international outlets, I'd, I'd say, are best for, for informational sources. Um, and other than that, I mean, thank you for watching thank you for being there you know it's uh it's so nice to have have that you know the audience because i know that people you got your lives you've got your kids your responsibilities um so i'd say you know just helping to, f to have, be on the information resource side of it is is the best thing that i think you can do outstanding <laughs> Um, so, um, how are you for time? Because there's a few questions, but I'll, do you want to? Do you feel like taking some questions, or are you about? I can take. Yeah. Okay, I so can, um, take while we were talking, we we uh, get all the questions on the pad here. So, let me um, let me see here. Um, here. I already heard that they they asked for Eva. Oh my God, is she even gonna come over here? Ah! Ah! <laughs> It's a doggy. Hey, hey, Poochie. All right, this is the part of the show where we show all the animals. <laughs> I had to put my put the cats on the other side of the door because they wanted to be all over the keyboard. So that's absolutely. Um, hi, resist. Good, good to see you. Look at there. That's a good dog. Yeah, this is Ava. How old is she? Nine months. Nine months or so. Ava's a good Aki she dog. She's like, yeah. <laughs> She's like, you guys talking politics and activism? I just want to take a nap. <laughs> like, give it a rest already. You and that Occupy stuff. You guys never stop. Yeah, you just never stop. <laughs> so the first question I'm going to toss at you is from Amigo, who is in uh, Mexico. And he's a longtime oh, wow. supporter of OPN and a good friend of ours. And he wants to know: Do you believe uh, direct? Let me see. 
do you believe in direct effective actions? And if you do, uh, what do you think the first most three important actions could be? Like, so do you uh, believe in direct I'm... action and what three are the most important? Um, I, I definitely do believe in direct action. Um, I think it has become a um, somewhat used and abused term in Occupy. Um, a lot of people would argue that um, the only successful actions are in mass numbers. And I think for like, if, if your direct action is a mass protest on a specific target, I think that that is, um, is definitely effective. I think if you come out in large numbers, and, and we see this more, I mean, I'm sure he knows he's in Mexico with the students we're doing, um, the mass amounts of students that came out to strike and, and they did it in Canada as well, and in Canada they were successful. I think that we show that the mass presence really um, has an impact and, and um, can affect whatever decision we're trying to get made. Um, for instance, like the teachers going on strike in Chicago, um, that's a direct action. You know, all deciding to collectively go on strike together, you know, and that and they that's they're forcing a negotiation. Um, other direct actions that I think can be effective are um, again specific targets. I think that if, for instance, let's say let's say your target's Monsanto because that's one of my least favorite corporations in the world. Um, you know, you can try to do some kind of disruption. And I think that's the key, is always having the element of disruption, whether you're disrupting traffic. Uh, you want to uh, disrupt business as usual. And this is something that Naomi Wolf speaks of, is that unless you draw attention to, to uh, the fact that everything is not okay, um, do not have a parade in the streets because that doesn't work. I mean, yes, we still have our parades, but um, it's, it's specific targeting certain um, certain places of business and 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 always having your message on point so if for instance if you're targeting Monsanto um, and you want to shut down main office which I think they did um, over on the West Coast um, that is a direct action that that yields some some result and and you're you're impacting the direct people that you have a, a, an issue with um, if, if I was going to stage uh, a direct action. I mean, I've I've always wanted to have a giant Monsanto action. I want to, to see. Yes, I'm going to tell them about the corn husks. I want to see thousands of people in the streets with corn husks, and um, I want them to march to the Monsanto main office um, building and throw them all at the building and say, "We do not want your mutated corn. We do not want your GMOs. And um, <laughs> please stop injecting our food with poisons." <laughs> And I think that the, the statement of physically throwing corn back at the corporation and saying, we do not want to eat your food, um, and doing it in enough numbers, um, I think that that's where you're, you're doing an action that's going to get attention. Your message is, is pretty uh, blatant. Um, and and um, if you have a big enough numbers, you can actually disrupt their business for the day, mm -hmm. which affects their, uh, their numbers and their sales. And obviously, um, one thing I have to say is that with all of this, where we're at right now in our country, even just talking about actions can get you into trouble. It's a very dangerous dialogue. Um, so we always have to be careful what we're saying we're going to do and where we're going to do it. Um, the, the intelligence, the surveillance, I myself have been targeted. It's, it sucks. And that's where we're at with with um, with trying to be an activist and trying to do uh, any kind of work that raises awareness. Um, but definitely the mass the mass numbers is, is where it's at. having a mass amount of people where the media cannot deny your presence. The you know the the um, in, in general just just the, the, the vision of that the the imagery mm -hmm. of of mass people and and you have to take the streets. You can't be satisfied with the sidewalk if they do not allow you into the streets. It's because you don't have people, and um, and that's what we saw in Charlotte. You know we didn't have have enough numbers and they were able to just stick a fire truck right in the road and there was no way around it and that was the end of that you know um so that's what i would say to that is i do believe in direct action but it needs to be strategic and um it, the message needs to be there and, and you need you usually need big numbers right right and that's one of my 
things that I'm always looking at too, and I have felt the same way. I was actually surprised at the small numbers in Charlotte. Um, you, you know, I, mm -hmm. I came down expecting expecting more, but you know, it just shows how far we have to go. So, um, the next question: Are you do you personally have contact with any of the worldwide Occupy related movements um, outside of the U.S.? Um, not completely directly. Uh, I have a few friends who have lived um, at the other occupations. Uh, I have a friend, Monica, who's in Spain. She was involved um, with, I forget which Occupy it was. Uh, I can't remember off the hand, off hand, but she was back and forth from um, Spain. I also have a friend. He's a photographer. He, um, he published the book um, Peace, Love, and Pepper Spray. He's from Brazil. And so he plans on doing work in Brazil and for their Occupy. Is that siren again? See, that's what I get for talking about direct action. <laughs> but um, much, mostly through Facebook and Twitter. So even though that's not totally like a personal relationship. Um, right. Um, uh, I do have several followers from out, uh, um, out of the country and a few of my Facebook friends are also from out of the country. So not as much. I'm hoping to expand that, though. I really want to connect with more people mm. outside of the U.S. because they're definitely getting it more. Um, and a lot of uh, people that I've taught are um, from countries uh, are very, very supportive and much more open-minded. And right off the bat, they, they understand what, what we're getting at, what we're going for. Um, because a lot of their countries are going through it as well, whether you're um, talking to somebody from Germany or from Greece or from England, um, even Australia, you know, uh, they're all they're all feeling the the pinch of this this actual global one percent. So, right, got a network network never ends. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, but that's again how you build numbers. You know, any way you can to build the numbers because in the reading I've done and all that success successful social justice movements always happen because of mass movement of people um, you know it's it's never just a small group that can make a big change it's always huge numbers so i'm a i'm a big proponent of numbers um this you sort of touched on this but i want to ask it what is your opinion on the future of occupy wall street specifically I think that the future of Occupy is um, going to be a splinter movement of sorts. I think that Occupy is um, evolving into several different Occupy, Occupy movements. Um, I think that what people have done over the last year is networked to uh, an extent where they have kind of discovered a, a cause that is a calling and that has become their main focus and all their energy is getting poured into that cause and i think that that is the smartest way to do it so what you're seeing is you're seeing the the strike debt movement you're seeing the protest of vector pipeline which is coming uh oh skype froze wrong and um taking a stand against tuition hikes um, there's, there's, oh, there's so many. There's also, um, you know, this alternative education movement where uh, the, there are schools that are coming out these, these free university type um, curriculums where, uh, you know, and, and like the Occupy Theory, the, the title publications. Um, I think that that's that's what's going to make Occupy continue to be relevant is that there are splinters of of, of groups and people who were too bogged down before with this, um, you know, daunting task of trying to satisfy every need and every cause. And um, they're actually starting to more um, hone in on what they really want to put their energy into. And, and there's also some great partnerships happening right now. We're seeing a lot more solidarity with Earth First, Code Pink, ACT UP. Mm -hmm. um, they're organizations that I had never really seen as much uh, of a presence uh, before in the last few months, 
um, definitely since May Day as well, um, reaching out to immigrant workers and, um, you know, the whole movement of the indignados, that is another splinter of Occupy where they're really trying to, to be part of that crusade to draw attention to um, the rights of undocumented workers and, you know, again, the the labor conditions and the labor workers as well the you know the unions it's always been this this love hate relationship with the unions so that's another aspect where occupy is still trying to find their place where you know for instance the uft we may know is democratically backed but at the end of the day we need to show solidarity with our teachers and students mm -hmm. so we need to get past that and you know at the end of the day you know it's going to take more time to to you know, change the conversation when it comes to politics. I think we need to, to stick with, let's build our numbers, let's show solidarity with each other. And um, and I think that that's what will be cool, is, is I think that there will, will be times throughout the year that we can all have those international days of action again. I think that that's, that's what I'm hoping for. Right. You know, I don't think that we're going to try to be as ambitious as we were last year, where we every week we're hoping to have, you know, tens of thousands in the streets. I think that there needs to be an opportunity for anticipation and that build and, and give people a, a chance to plug in. And, uh, and, and hopefully that's how we'll, we'll, we'll evolve this year um, is, is through the, you know, pouring more of our energy into the smaller um, groups with, with just as big of a cause. Mm -hmm. and, and hopefully, uh, I think I'm seeing that that's where the energy is going. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that that's, that's going to be the the, uh, the next year, right? Um, and so, right. this is, I feel like a sludgy predictor here. <laughs> no, no, it's it it's good. I mean, I I think I feel like the um, localism is going to be ultimately the solution because if everybody's working on a local level and they're networked together, then suddenly that becomes global. Um, but that's just my two cents. Uh, the last question I'm going to I'm going to give and then then we're going to let you go because you've been so generous with your time but you just mentioned um, like the the international um, events and this question just came in uh, do you think we need to coordinate with the global movement to achieve what we want here in the US or do you think these movements are separate I think that um I think America is the toughest nut to crack. I, I think that you you see much more of a presence in, in the streets in other countries because there is, I think there's more of a unified culture. And they've also been at it longer than us. I think a lot of countries have struggled longer than us. America is a very young nation. Um, so it's hard to wake people up to the idea of a revolution being necessary or you know some kind of uh, government upheaval being necessary or you know, um, simple things like campaign finance reform seem to be a really difficult task to get across to everybody that this needs to happen. Um, so while I do think we're part of a global struggle, I do think we're in a global crisis in that it, it, everything is affecting the, um, the way we all live. Um, the U.S. is going to be the toughest one. And um, unfortunately, if we, if we go to war with Iran, that could escalate things. I'm not quite sure how that's going to change things. Um, I do think that right now we have to keep drawing attention to what we are doing as a nation on an international level. And the people need to be more enraged. They need to be more upset with not just the Obama administration, but with the Bush administration. People have written up in the last years and just because he's out of office, it's, it's if he's off the hook. And um, so I think that there needs to be more of uh, an anti-war movement. And, and that's one of the things my friend John Penley was talking about in Charlotte, was feeling like what, the anti-war people are not here because it's an election year. You know, the anti-war people are going back to their homes because they're worried about who they're going to vote for. And it kind of, it's a shame that we have to go through these cycles where people actually take a step back from the issues because they're distracted by by what's happening, you know, in, in Washington and, and on the campaign trail. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens when this election is over. I think that that might, um, that might stir up, depending on which way it goes, um, that may stir up a lot more interest and, and motivation.
information mm -hmm. from people. So I think that we need to focus on the U.S. because we are the perpetrators for a lot of what is causing exactly. an international crisis. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the thing. We we are the epitome <laughs> of of this greed and and um, and and the fact that I feel like we're such a hypocritical country at this point. We we just want to be so star spangled awesome, but we are taking away our own civil liberties. So. Um, there, there should be more people in the streets. I honestly don't understand. I know that I have no excuse because like, a year ago I was not like this either. But there comes a time where you can wake up and it is possible. So I'm ho hoping that um, you know I, I can be a testimony to more people about you know you, you can do it too and you can decide some things are just not worth living for if you can't live the way you truly deserve to live. Yep. So to be a testimony and be a catalyst and we could hope yeah, for, for none I, better. Yeah. You're <laughs> incredibly awesome and I have so much respect yeah. for you and what you and Jack are, are have in front of you and for the work you've done I want to say thank you very much. You're very inspiring you. and I've learned a lot and um, we're getting a lot of commentary from the chatters i think you just rocked them all they're enthused and invigorated <laughs> um we're going to get out there and yeah. you know try to talk up your project and see if we can get some help there but i want to thank you for being on tonight with us we really appreciate it and i'm very thank touched so and much. honored thank you so much so i appreciate it this is great oh great well i hope you guys have a good evening and uh, we'll stay in touch all right. Thanks again, Mark. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>